the more you learn how it feels in your body. And the energies are so subtle. Like they're not, you're not just going to see a spirit standing there talking in sentences. It's right. interpreting. I call myself a spirit translator because it's interpreting. If I feel this, what does that mean? Well, how do you know if you haven't practiced? So when I first started, I'd be like, I'm feeling a little bit of a leg sensation. You know, and the person is. In this part two with Shannon Torrance, Shannon opens up about her remarkable journey into mediumship, a path that transformed her life both personally and professionally. With an open heart and a willingness to believe in her abilities, Shannon broke through her limits, becoming a spirit translator and a beacon of hope for others. Through her spiritual guidance, Shannon not only found her own healing, but also discovered a profound way to support clients in connecting with their loved ones on the other side. Together, we'll explore the powerful intersection of mind, body, and spirit wellness, discussing how we eat and how we nourish ourselves directly impacts our overall well-being. We delve into the wisdom gleaned from near-death experiences and the spiritual messages Shannon has received from me in my reading. With vulnerability, she shares her struggles with love and sex addiction, how societal expectations led her to silence parts of herself as she attempted to live out a, quote, normal, end quote, life through marriage. But the journey didn't end there. Shannon bravely recounts her path to recovery, illuminating her spiritual awakening and the insights gained along the way. Her story is not just one of personal struggle, but also a wellspring of wisdom for the youth of today. Shannon's journey reminds us that embracing our true selves is a key to healing and fulfillment. This episode is edited down from its original very long content so that we can stay within our two-part model. Join us as we dive deep into Shannon's extraordinary and incredible story, a testament to resilience, connection, and the power of spirit because I've never done it before and soon found out that I could do it. And Monica's class really, really kind of put me over the edge. I showed up thinking, I'm not going to be able to do this. And she's like, you're doing it. You're doing it right now. And so she spent a lot of time with us, which was great too. And so I studied and I meditated every single day. And I did practice readings every day, uh, twice a week for free for about two years. I just kept, and the more I did them, I mean, I sucked at first. So Anyone who has an interest in learning mediumship, don't beat yourself up because you're not going to know what you're doing for a while. Well, it's like anything. And the expectation around that is that all of a sudden you're going to be able to see or yeah. get a download <laughs> of absolutely everything from someone. They People don't understand that it's it's like you're learning a new language and you um, there are impressions and some people have a stronger area with impressions. Some people can see within their consciousness, within, you know, not with their physical eyes. Some people can see with their physical eyes. So there's so many variations of that, that I think often when people say that you want to go to a medium or, or you know, I guess like John Edwards, yeah. his, the way that he works is different from the way that other mediums work. But I think that you can hone that ability because I believe we all have these senses, whether it's being empathic or intuitive or psychic or um, being able to channel or all of these things. I think that those are just parts of our brain or our consciousness that have been turned off. Yes. Yes. And, and even back on. And the more you practice the more you learn how it feels in your body. And the energies are so subtle. Like they're not, you're not just going to see a spirit standing there talking in sentences. It's right. interpreting. I call myself a spirit translator because it's interpreting. 
if I feel this, what does that mean? Well, how do you know if you haven't practiced? So when I first started, I'd be like, I'm feeling a little bit of a leg sensation. You know, and the person would be like, oh, my grandfather had his leg amputated. I go, okay, well, now I know that feeling. So I can kind of say, okay, this person either something happened to the leg. And over time, your symbols get stronger because every reading you're like, okay, I've seen that before and I know what it was. I'll try it again. So the last time I saw this, it meant this. How about with you? It's I see a red balloon. Is there a birthday coming up? Yes. Okay. That's twice. I know that that symbol now means like through time. I'm like, yes. Now I know spirits. Like we're going to show you a red balloon every time, every time it's a birthday. So, and I'll say they're even growth spurts. So even from the time that I read you a few weeks ago, I've had a huge growth spurt. So I don't know what bluebell means. (laughs) What does that mean? Oh, you're going to make me cry. Oh, good. (laughs) That's what we want. Um, so my mom used to call me blue bird. Oh, and, um, and then that kind of went to whatever kind of blue something, blue bird, blue bell, (gasps) blue, but, um, I have a dog, an Australian shepherd that, um, I call, um, his name is blue, but it's the French way blue, very blue, but everybody calls him blue. And so, I call him Bluebell. And just the other day, yesterday, maybe it just registered that I call him Bluebell. And it's a very thread through yes, our I... family of Bluebird, Bluebell, like all of that. Wow. So, okay. There we go. That's okay. a nice connection. Thank you. That That is. Thank you, spirit. Thank you. That really helps, oh, helps me out too. So and I'm feeling spirit now. And why? Because I went to the near-death experience IANS conference, the International Association for Near-Death Studies conference. I'm getting chills already. This is what the, yep, yep. And uh, spirit loves this. So two, last week I was there for four days straight with people like you, people who've had near-death experiences. So when someone has a near-death experience, their soul leaves their body and then comes back in. And now it's really connected to the quote unquote other side, other dimension, because it remembers who it is and what it's capable of. So now your auric field is even wider than most people's. Lots of NDE people come back, mediums, seeing auras, being able to like do psychic work. And so when I walked into that room, I had full body chills and I thought I had COVID because it wouldn't stop. I was like, am I getting sick? What's happening? I talked to other people there and they said, no, that's just the energy of this conference. We were also on Native American land in Phoenix and in Chandler, Arizona. It was beautiful on this gorgeous resort. And so within an hour, I'm just like, I walk up to the volunteer coordinator and I'm like, I have a spirit here with me. His name is Phil. And he just burst into tears. It's like just the whole conference I was feeling, oh my God, there's a man standing next to me. I can feel him. And then I'd say, who are you? And he'd say, go in that room. And I go, and I I go, well, up to the first person I felt drawn to. And I'd say, there's a man here who's huge and tall. That, that's my grandpa. And before you know it, I'm going around doing readings like never before. I mean, this happens sometimes, but it's not on like that. So, so then I think too about, I'm seeing laying in bed and then waking, opening my eyes and seeing an angel standing there. <laughs> is that you? Have you seen that? Yes. So the way that it came is I was lying in bed and I was just, I was uh, stressed about my son. This was, uh, he was probably 10 at the time. It was a financial issue and he wanted to go to camp and I was praying about it. And I just started to close my eyes and the angel came like right here. Oh. And I went, oh, yeah. And then it was gone. That's, they just acknowledged visiting you and um, coming. And I do believe it was an angel as a, you know, I mean, I, I know that your loved ones are there too, but it felt very strongly like we wanted you to see it was you, an angel, yeah. That it, it was an angel. It feels very tall. I see. I know that they don't literally have wings, but that's how we perceive them because they're these beings of light. Um, and they and they just wanted to confirm that, yes, you were not dreaming. That was oh, real. Like we were that. here. So then I've been back for a week. And it's like, I can't stop communicating with spirit. Like You're on fire. That's awesome. It's And then I just did a reading yesterday. And it was like, for the first time ever, it was easy. It was like, it's never, sometimes it's easier than others. And, but I'm always in that sense of, is this right? And, and I just went, no, spirit's here already. I know it. I don't have to think. I don't have to do anything. I literally just started telling a story and everything I said was like spot on. 
And when, when you did my reading and I think I said to you, it's when you, you were kind of questioning and I said, everything is right. That's one thing that I did learn is that no matter what you get, it's right. Whether the person acknowledges it or not. Oh, by the way, one of the things that you said to me is you said the name Jack. And I was like, no, okay, um, I'm not, you know, connecting with the Jack. And I got off the call with you and within an hour. Jack was with me and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Because a Jack, a friend had transitioned and totally did not make the connection when we were on together. And yes. What happens? It's what happens. And then as a human, you're like, oh, they're saying it's wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. And I've, I will say it's literally exactly what you said. If it's coming through, it's right. And it's a matter of, so last night I just said, just relax. Just literally don't even th- just, just let it flow and it flowed and that day before i was with some friends we were setting up for an event and suddenly oh my god there's a spirit here so strong and usually they're like i can feel it a little bit but this was like bombarding me and i'm like and i'm like i said to my friend i know i mean she's one of my closest friends but i'm like there's a spirit here And then all of a sudden I got so dizzy, I almost fainted. So these symptoms for me are just, I didn't used to get so dizzy. I would feel like I was going to faint. And I don't mind it. It's fine. I can function. And so I sat, I said, I need to, I said, someone's bipolar. They took their life and it's a woman. And, and she just looks at me and looks at all the other girls. She's like, yep. One of our close friends, his wife just left us last week and that's her. And immediately I was like, she needs, she's needing me to say something to you. And so ultimately it led me to the husband who, and I said, look, I don't usually approach people, but the next day she came back, she kept saying, tell my husband and my kids, tell my husband and my kids. I'm like, I don't know if he's spiritual. I don't want to, he's, I don't know if he, how in grief he is. And she was like, you tell him. And so I did. And he's like, thank you so much. I did need to, I'm like, I'm, I said, look, please, I don't want to approach you in this way, but your wife will not leave. And yeah. so finally he's like, that sounds like her. So it's trust there too, you know, not walking up to people Absolutely. and just dumping this on them. But if this spirit is like, you need to tell him, you need to tell him, you need to tell him, I have to trust that she knows better than I do what he needs. Well, there is a responsibility in this work and, and, um, and I don't consider myself like, I don't, I don't do this officially. Yeah. Right. So but you that, are a medium. I just don't do it officially. And, yeah. And it's not something that I've I've worked on. If it comes, it comes. And um I think that like, my mom is always the first one at the door. Like whenever yeah. there is a medium around me, now she comes periodically for me, but I don't like open the door. Like I yeah. don't um, I, I, it's just not something that I'm actively in when I'm coaching with someone. If some, if, if that door opens or if that's something that the client wants, it may or may not happen. Yeah. It is something that if you're focused on it and you open the door there, they, they want to communicate. Yeah. So they'll come flooding in, but there is a responsibility. Like if you are at the grocery store, I say this in my classes also about psychic development that if you're at the grocery store and you get the impression that, you know, that the, you know, husband or the woman or whatever is having an affair on the other partner, it's not your responsibility to, <laughs> no. to share that information. That's an impression that you're getting. And it is, is a responsibility and to understand how to navigate this space with integrity. Exactly. And I was doing my laundry yesterday and she blended with my energy again. And she kept saying, reach out to him. I said, tell me what to do because I do not know him well enough to do that. And I don't want to interfere. And she's like, he needs to hear it and you got to tell him. So I'm like, I'm going to trust you on this. But I was so nervous after I sent him an email. I said, look, if this is not your thing, you're not comfortable or it's you're not ready. But if you're ready, I have a message. And he's like, please. And he's like, is it bad? And I had to tell him the spirit does not give bad news. That is not they are only wanting to give you information that will help or heal you. I am not going to even be shown bad news. Even if I'm shown a health issue, they'll say, just, I'll say, don't panic about it. Just get it checked. Like if I see you've got a heart thing, I'll say it to you, but don't, 
it doesn't mean you're dying. It just means like there's an issue that needs to be addressed. And I remember when I was watching Tyler Henry's show, uh, The Hollywood Medium, he mm -hmm. did a reading for um, Alan Thicke. And he kept saying, heart attack, like there's something about your heart. You've got to get it checked out. And he passed from a heart attack mm -hmm. right after that. So it's like, you don't want to scare somebody, but you just, but if you have that knowledge, you can say, Hey, you know, it's probably fine, but just why don't you go see a doctor and make sure that everything's okay. Um, right. just, yeah. So now that you've been doing this, you kind of have a, a dual profession, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do they dovetail? Uh, do they dovetail? It's funny. I don't, well, I would say they don't. Yes, they do. Because the way that you're talking about trust and just less is more. So don't reach for the information. Just let it come in. And when I, re and when I did that yesterday, I can describe it only as basically you're turning on, you're turning on your awareness and it was more claircognizance based than usual. So a lot of times I'll see things like I see a blue butterfly. I see this. This time it was, I just know that this girl's dad's in spirit. It's almost like a memory mm -hmm. as if she told me that before. And I'm just like, yeah, 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 your dad, he's over there, huh? And it's like, it's this subtle, just, I don't know how I know it, but I know it. And the whole reading kind of went like that, where I was like, yeah, and he tells me he did this, this, he liked these things. And there was one time where you had, it's like all these memories that he was showing me. And it was almost as if they were my memories. So it was very subtle, but it's the same thing with acting, whether it's voice acting or on camera acting, acting the way I was taught it is it's not acting, it's being. It's being, le I mean, yes, people will argue because people will say, oh, that actor's just himself in every role. I'm like, he should be himself in every role. Sure, you can be like Johnny Depp and you can be crazy a wild character. characters, mm -hmm. but for the most part, all a character is, is you in that same situation. And well, great an aspect of those characters in him. Yes. And, and just like all the voices that you do, there are yeah. aspects of you in that. You have to tap into that. It's some, some experience that you tap yeah. into. But if you told me, okay, you're like, I played a mom as a wolf. Well, if I took that really literally, I'd be like, oh, I'm a wolf. That's not going to be a way to convey expression and emotion to be growling the whole time or barking. So I'm like, okay, she's a wolf. How does that inform how I go through the world? You know, and it's more about what is, if I were a wolf, not like I am pretending to be, it's not pretending. Acting isn't pretending. Mediumship isn't pretending. It's being and receiving and allowing. So it's letting the emotion come from your heart, letting the message come from your heart. That's the same thing in acting. So you can, I mean, yes, maybe you are having me play a goofy animal, but at the same time, the the communication has to come from a soul place. It's not just a lot of people come to me and say, people have said I should do voiceover because I have a really cool voice. And I'm like, it's not the way your voice sounds. It's how, you, so it's not about the voice. It's about, are you telling, are you sharing a truth? Are right, you connecting with your audience? Of it. Yeah. It's, you can have a really weird voice and be a terrible actor. Like a really like funny voice that would be cool, but you don't know how to act and like not deliver realistically. Or you can have, uh, be a really good actor, but have a weird voice that's just not going to fit in anywhere, which is a different thing where it's like, I say that, but then yes, also you have to not have like a grating voice or something that's like too distracting. But for the most part, that's mediumship. It's literally less forcing and more allowing, let go so you can receive it's so easy. It's a great definition. Oh. And yet I have made it hard. It's like, well, we all yeah. do. That because yeah. We, we second guess ourselves. Yeah. But once you have so many confirmations, I know, and outrageous confirmations yeah. that you settle into a confidence level, no matter what anybody says, because you know, in time they're going to come around, they're going to understand what that message was. And you did your part. You gave the message. Yes. And that's what you were hired to do is give the message. So now you're a voice actor, you're mediumship, by the way, I'm going to weave in segments that aren't yeah. too personal. That's per no. of, right. Of, of our time together, because one of the things was, you know, 
Wendy, my friend Wendy, who had, is on the other side, gave gave me a birthday cake, right? Yes. So, and it's my birthday this month. So oh, yeah, very yeah. Cool. So you also, and the reason why we are together and we've become friends is because you launched your podcast, your YouTube channel. And so tell me about next chapter, shifting gears, what, you know, again, you're using your voice, which just, I find the story just so fascinating that you're using your voice again in this platform. And, you know, tell us about that. Yeah. um, Well, during that whole pandemic thing, like when I lost my voice, I had been thinking about starting a podcast. And for a little while, I was like, I can't actually, now I just can't speak. But my first podcast idea was that I wanted to do one about recovery. So for sex and love addicts and um, interview all the wonderful, awesome people I've met and talk about healing from that. And then that was around the time I started watching a lot of near-death experiences. And I just was like, this is all I want to think about or talk about. But I thought, well, who's going to watch my channel as opposed to Jeff Mara podcast or um, Next Level Soul or whatever these other ones were. Inspire Nation is one of my favorites. And I thought, well, you have your own thing to bring to the table. It doesn't matter. Just do it because you want to do it. Don't worry about the numbers. So I started interviewing just like mediums I knew, like just people I knew that were that were uh, healers and stuff. And they weren't, you know, it was like they didn't have NDEs, but right in the beginning, I had 200 followers. And I used to watch videos from Trisha Barker, who wrote Angels in the OR, one of my favorite NDE books. And I thought, she's not going to do my podcast. I only have 200 followers. And I wasn't following her on Instagram. But one day I got a notification that Trisha Barker liked your post or something. And so she must have, it must have been a hashtag or something. I don't remember what it was. And I just took that as a sign from the universe. So I reached out to her and was like, look, I only have 200 followers, but I, would you do it? And she's like, yeah, of course. So she did it. We became friends and she started telling everybody about my podcast. Thank you, Trisha. She's one of my dear friends. Um, from there, that's when I started to be able to just, Trisha sent me and then I'd get any interview I wanted pretty much, you know, not, not like Eben Alexander or um, people that are. <laughs> so busy at this point that they probably just have to really prioritize. And I started doing that. And slowly, my voice came back, you know, as I was working, doing that. And um, ultimately, that's been become my passion project, um, spreading the word. And my mission is to offer hope and inspiration to people who have fear around death, who have lost loved ones, and they're just in grief, and they need that comfort and just to sort of bring to light that this is real. And I want to present it in a very authentic format where my guests are, are for the most part, really grounded people Mm -hmm. that can, so that if you come in and you're like, I don't know if I believe in this, it's like, oh, just listen to what Lee has to say. She's pretty reasonable, very articulate. You can tell you're not crazy. Like, you know, it's (laughs) like, let's, let's talk to some people that are really smart people really grounded and they're not presenting this in some kind of like inaccessible way. And then now that I've gotten that off the ground and really started to thrive with that podcast more, now had time to start Still Standing, which isn't just about sex and love uh, addiction, but it's been something I've wanted to do for a long time, which is to interview people that have been through obstacles and challenges. Because then once I went through my own, I was like, I need the hope because I was so depressed when I lost my voice. I was didn't want to be alive anymore. I was like, if I can't express myself or do an act anymore or do anything. And my, and my, one of my doctors said, you need to just give it up and become an accountant. She was a terrible voice coach. Uh, and she's treated a lot of, um, celebrities. And my voice doctor was like, that woman tells everyone they're never going to work again. And she's like, and she called her and yelled at her because that woman lost her voice and had to stop performing. So it was the sort of that bitterness coming out of like, Misery loves company. Go ahead. I, I love I love the journeys that we can share because we are in a time of such contrast. Yeah. That people are experiencing these kinds of obstacles privately and suffering alone. Yeah. And to have a platform to be able to share these kinds of stories, which is 
what this one is about, right? Yeah. Overcoming obstacles and talking about spirituality and different ways that we can connect to each other, that we are not separate. We all have a thread of connection. And, um, and, and I do want to say these podcasts around near-death experiences, all the ones that I have been on for interviews, the thing is that it is the most beautiful, giving, authentic community, and we all help each other yep. and support the goal. And I have just, I, I've just been blown away by it. Yeah, so, that's why I, I told you, I was like, you've yep. got to go to the conference next year. Yeah, it's, yes, I absolutely will. But I was also thinking just even the connections that we're making on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. The friendships and every single person was like, yes, you definitely should be doing a podcast. Yes, definitely. Whatever you need. How can I help you? And 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 that's how we are spreading the word. Exactly. That's how we're getting this message out. That's why I went to the conference and so I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I was going to say that's why I went and knew hundreds of people there because of this. I love it. I want to talk about the the sex and love um, addiction and when you realize that that's what it was. How did that happen? How did you know that that's what it was? Yeah, I, that's the thing. I always think if I had known this when I was 13, I mean, obviously they wouldn't have called me a sex addict because I wasn't having sex, but sex and love addiction encompasses not just sex. It's intimacy, it's um, vulnerability, it's uh, fantasy, it's fantasizing that someone is somebody else and that they can give you something they can't give you. You can get lost in the fantasy of what it could be instead of what it is. And so it's the, it's the community. It's I was married and I married someone that I loved dearly, but I was not attracted to him, but I'd always dated the unavailable guy. So I told myself, well, this guy is a wonderful person and I should marry him. My parents will like him. He's my best friend. I'm not sexually attracted to him, but that's okay because life isn't about sex. Like I, I just shut that at 30 years old. I'm like, I'm just going to shut that down. And I was like, but he'll be a great dad and we'll have a family. And then I won't need to worry about sex anymore because I just was deluded and which wasn't fair to him because um, no man, I mean, no one, no human should feel like they're not desired or not wanted. And I loved him for the human he was. He's fun, and there's nothing wrong with him. It was just me. It was my own stuff. And, well, and so it's not even yeah. about not being wanted, right? It's it's the feeling of intimacy. There is intimacy. A level of intimacy that is important and I think in in any relationship. Otherwise just be friends. Yeah. And I but made the mistake right? yeah. intimacy, right? Yeah. And I made the mistake, though, of moving in with him within like the first month and suddenly instant relationship. And I was like, I don't really want to make out with him, but I but he's so wonderful and we laugh and have a great time together. And that was selfish. I now see, you know, it's like that that was selfish. But so we almost didn't get married because I ended up cheating on him just a week before the wedding. We're like, we have to wrap this up in a bow because everyone's coming to Hawaii and we can't tell our families that we're breaking up a week before the wedding who've just put deposits on everything and we can't let the family down. So we somehow convinced ourselves that, um, it's okay. We'll just, we'll just put, fix it all and it'll be tied up in a bow and we'll just forget. We'll just sweep it all under the rug. Oh, wow. Cause basically what was happening was it was my first experience of right before we were getting married. I met this guy that now I understand, um, is a sex and love addict, like probably the most severe sex and love addict I've ever met. Gratefully, he's in recovery now, but this was 20 years ago. And so uh, it was like, I remember seeing him and it was like, heroin. I've, I've never done it, but I imagine that's what it's like. It was like, now I understand that as a twin flame soulmate kind of. It's a karma. craving. It's, uh, it was this like intoxicating, <gasps> couldn't breathe. And I wasn't someone who would ever cheat on someone. It wasn't my, I was a good girl. I was a nice girl. But. I got completely addicted to him. And then I told him, we have to stop this. I'm getting married. Like, I'm getting married. We got to stop. And then I got married and just was like, okay, I'm going to forget it. That guy ever existed and just move on. And then that guy came back into the picture and I got obsessed and addicted, was sneaking out of the house. Like, it was like Elizabeth Gilbert's book, only she didn't do that. Um, Eat, Pray, Love, mm -hmm. where she described sobbing in her closet 
he kept asking me why I was in the closet sobbing. It was like, I have this lovely guy and I'm just something's why I'm, I'm miserable and I'm cheating on him and I have guilt and I'm not trying to pull the wool over his eyes. Like I'm not trying to like get away with this. I just want out of this. I just don't want to be here. And so that took me into this just toxic relationship and it lasted about 10 years on and off. I mean, it was addiction. Wow, okay. And I didn't know it was an addiction. I didn't know that that was a thing. What, you but thought I, it was love. I, yeah, I thought it was just, this is the person. But then he kept dumping me and sleeping with other people. And it was like pure chaos because he hated himself and he was an addict. And I didn't know what was happening. But at this time, I met this woman who I now know was just put in my life for this reason. Um, and she, I got to know her. And she said, she was my age. And she's like, this, she said, Shannon, I can't listen to this anymore. She said. I was like this with a guy and I had to go to a 12 step program. And she said, you're, I was just, I couldn't talk about anything else. I was 102 pounds. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was obsessed. My work was suffering. I was a terrible employee. Nobody knew, but I was, it was like that, but there's no actual drugs except your own brain chemicals, oxytocin and dopamine. And you're high. And then he doesn't call for two weeks and you feel like you're going to take your life. Withdrawal, it's pain. And so Long, 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 long story short, she said, I'll go to a meeting with you if you want to go to a meeting. And it took about 10 years till I could really get there. But it was, I didn't know about Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. I didn't know that sex addiction, love addiction was, a, I'm more of a love addict, um, was a thing. And that it can be just as destructive. People take their lives over it all the time. People murder people over this addiction. Just wow. watch any Dateline or 20, 48 hours about right. tri love triangles and how the wife or the lover gets, the lover kills the spouse or whatever. And it's mm. because we need connection. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say for someone listening that is saying, hey, well, I wonder yeah. if I have that, right? What, yeah. what, are, what are maybe the symptoms or maybe yeah. the three things that people should look for. Yeah, I would actually even suggest we're not, you know, like in 12 step, we're not allowed to like endorse the program because it's not, sure. it's not for profit and it's, we're not allowed to advertise it, but I, but you can look it up. I mean, it's, it's like there, are, you look up characteristics of love addiction and you'll find it. Um, but I will say putting people on a pedestal, expecting people to be responsible for our feelings. And when they don't meet our expectations, uh, blaming them for our despair. It can obviously manifest in different ways. But listen, I've sent tons of my girlfriends into this program. I think it's a little very common in women, especially, but it's common in men too. Men tend to act out more sexually most of the time, but a lot of gay men and straight women tend to, uh, we, we love too much. We wear our heart on our sleeves. So we tend to chase people that are unavailable, which then reinforces that we are unlovable. We tend to, and, and not recognizing our own unavailability that we're afraid of intimacy. That's why we choose people that are unavailable. Obsession. Uh, putting, with, yeah. Obsession with a person. With a person. Lim limerence, which is, the, which is my favorite word. Limerence. And limerence oh. is that feeling you get where you're like high on somebody and you're, they're sparkly and new and you get butterflies in your stomach. And the thing is, that's normal for a new love. But it's this feeling of like magic, like totally falling into this person. You idealize people. You don't really get to know them because you don't see their actual faults. You see them as like angels singing when they walk by and you become obsessed. And it's really putting aside your own, uh, also hiding your needs, your dependency mm -hmm. needs from yourself and others is a big one. So I always played cool, like, oh, he's sleeping with other people. I'll pretend I don't care. And then he'll see how cool I am and how <laughs> worthy I am because who wouldn't want a girlfriend that lets him sleep around? It's, it's like, right. meanwhile, I was like suicidal because he's sleeping with other people, but I'm convincing myself it's okay because oh, I have no to make boundaries. it okay. It's, it's a lack no of boundaries. Respect, no right? boundaries. It's a lack Huge. of self-respect. No boundaries. And the way that you described it, it, it reminds me of the Neptune influence when your astrological sign is in the Neptune planet and it's very watery and yeah. it gives you like if you meet somebody during that time in your astrological chart you put them on a pedestal and you see them not for who they are but for what your illusion of them is yes and you'll just degrade yourself you'll do anything to get that love because without it it feels like you're dying and it's it's a very primal 
thing because especially women were designed to bond with oxytocin because the mate, if we are with a man, I mean, but even if they're lesbian, it's the same bio biology, that our mate is supposed to protect us and take care of our young. And it's a literal survival instinct that the person's supposed to commit to you so that you can keep the young safe and that that person can fight off predators and protect you from being attacked by predators. So it's a very primal instinct. And if you have a secure attachment style, if somebody is not committing to you, you can be like, peace out, I'm bored. But someone with anxious attachment like I have is going to be like, I will do anything to keep you if it's degrading myself, putting up with breadcrumbs, putting up with anything less than respect. Of It's like that or I die because I don't have coping tools. I don't know how to take care of myself. So the healing comes with learning to love yourself, not as an idea, but well, how do we le learn to love ourselves? We take good care of ourselves. We find things that we enjoy. We set boundaries. We stay fit, uh, stay active and fit. So endorphins are going. We spend time with people who, who love us unconditionally. Our girlfriends, our, my gay friends, my girlfriends start to find the things that make us feel safe and learning to self-soothe. Like it's brilliant conversation. Um, and so helpful, I'm sure for, for many, many, um, it, it does drill down to really it's, um, it, it's mindfulness work. Mine. Yeah. That, and actually I'm going to, it's a good segue. I'm going to put the link to the book, the free book, Roadmap to Living Mindfully, Understanding Self-Love, Self-Care, and Self-Mastery. Because when we learn to fill our cup and we, we nourish ourselves mindfully and give from the overflow, we realize we're not going outside ourselves to fill a void, which I think in any addiction that you're dealing with, from retail therapy addiction to yeah. sex and love to drugs and alcohol, whatever. It is a separateness. It's a feeling of longing. It's a feeling of not feeling full. And I know for myself and my own spiritual journey, although I haven't gone through the addictive uh, process, I still had a lot of healing to do around looking outside myself for happiness or fulfillment or contentment. Whereas when I did the deeper work, I was able to even all that out. So no high highs, no low lows, more of an equanimous, even more on the upper scale of just feeling happy. Peaceful. Right. Peaceful. And that peacefulness comes from the developing that within oneself, not seeking that outside. So I loved those things that you were saying, right? Developing self-love, caring for yourself by getting out and you know, even as simple as walking, getting out in the fresh air, getting in the sun, what you put into your body is also highly important. And, you know, there are all kinds of things online talking about what they're spraying on our foods. And even when we try to buy things that are organic or healthy, we have to be super careful about ingredients that are in our food. Like sugar is put in almost everything. I I, I don't eat sugar at all anymore because that's, that's what made me sick is was the gut disorder started from too much sugar. So no gluten and no sugar. What is your, what is your kind of go-to, what's your favorite healthy food that you I tend to, I mean, granted it's, I do low carb diet. Um, mm -hmm. just be, it was because of the, not for weight loss, I'm pretty small, but, um, because I had a gut infection and the bacteria was thriving on sugar, I couldn't mm. eat fruit for three years. So. Fortunately, I can eat fruit, but fruits, vegetables, I will eat meat if someone else makes it, but I really eat vegetarian most of the time. And so, and I'm not like, organic food can be, is very expensive these oh days. Oh my gosh. Please. But I drink, I drink whole milk every day. I like reincorporated coffee, but it's organic. It's grass fed. It's uh, lactose free. Mm -hmm. So I tend to be a whole food shopper. It's my one splurge where it's like, I look at ingredients. Processed foods have sugar. So my whole thing is I can eat anything. It's just, I can eat gluten even, but I avoid sugar. That's the one thing that I do not do. So, and I don't drink alcohol. Um, and I used to, but I, I get migraines. So I, I drink no alcohol. Uh, haven't had a drink for like six years or some seven years. Um, and even then it would be maybe one. And, uh, so it's more about what I don't eat. I eat a very broad, I'll eat anything pretty much, but 
I prefer health foods. So paleo is kind of like my, my jam. I think that we all have to find what works for us. Not, yes. There's not a one size fits all. And I have come, it's taken me a lot of years, but I've come to the point of where I, I know what my body wants. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I won't have that pizza. Yeah. Oh yeah, I will if it's, yeah. But I, I'm conscious if I do it, I know my body's going to react. It's going to yes. feel sluggish or my joints might hurt or things like that. So, you know, it's a conscious decision. And then I don't feel guilty about it because I made a conscious decision. Yes. And I found ways to make things that are sugar-free or very oh, low yeah. sugar. I mean, there's some amazing recipes out there. I, we talked about Levitin, which is we did. the yeah. uh, superfood, green superfood product, which I've been on for five years now. Yeah. When my naturopath turned me on to that, I was really struggling with thyroid condition, um, adrenal fatigue, all kinds of things. And I had zero energy in my tank. Um, but using foods like you know, the superfood product, I was buying so many supplements and and then I would stop taking them because I got tired of taking so many pills. It is because I take it too now because you recommended it. For- and- Wendy, your friend, I don't know. I didn't get a whole lot, uh, except that you might have a matching piece of jewelry with her. <laughs> oh, do you? Okay. Is it a necklace with a heart or something? It's, um, it's, it's like a, um, it's like a shape of a woman. Uh-huh. You know, I forget what they call that. Um, a silhouette. No, it's a shape of, it's like, um, it's a very metaphysical, spiritual kind of symbol. Okay. Um, and, and so she has one, uh, I have one and, um, a third person. And I've always wanted to do something like this where ask people for their advice. Like what is the piece of advice that you would give at this age that you are to either your younger self or a younger person that might help them on their journey with a little bit more using. That's I actually wrote a whole article on it for a journal. Like my friend has a, wrote a book about high school, like nurturing children and in high school. And uh, she's become like an expert and she had me write it for her blog a long time ago. Um, And it's, Okay, it's along the lines of love yourself, but how does a kid know how to do that, right? So it is, it's so hard to say because I think it just, I don't know how to teach somebody to grow into a a self that is self-loving, but it is, a lot of things happen as we grow up and in school, kids can be really mean to each other and say really hurtful things to each other because they're just all insecure and they're, they're, they're not, I think we get really swayed as children or as high school kids with people saying things to you and they're like somebody that you regard like a popular kid or something or and I think it's not letting anyone tell you who you are and there's all this oh you're not cool because you don't wear this so you're not cool because of this and all that stuff is just it's just not real it's it's uh people's projections but it's also kids people's fears so don't let anyone tell you who you are Don't let anyone pigeonhole you or tell you that you're not enough because your hair is weird or you're on the spectrum or you have some physical difference or anything. You're not wearing the coolest clothes or you don't have money. Whatever it is, people are always going, there's always going to be people that are going to tell you what's wrong with you. It is all about them. It is all about them. It has nothing to do with you. It's not my, it's remembering not my circus, not not my monkey, not my circus, that anytime someone throws a spear at you, it's because they don't feel good about themselves. And I have trouble. I get, I'm an empath and I get very wounded and it takes me like a week to get over it when someone lashes out at me. But here's the best thing. My mom's, my my aunt said to my mom, just because someone's mad at you doesn't mean you did something wrong. And so, and sometimes you did, and that's okay to say, yeah, okay, I own that. But what I'm going to say, we are all from the same light source. My friend, David Williamson, check out his NDE. He said he went to the other side and realized that we are all orbs of light. So just because we're wearing different costumes, we are all the same. 
you are me and I am you. So these are just costumes and we all come with different religions, ethnicities, physical abilities or disabilities. Just you are loved inherently. You are lovable inherently. And I don't mean this from a, in, a, in a religious way, but you are all part of source energy, whether you call it God, higher power. Not one human being is more special than another. We are all worthy of love. And so, as Betty Guadagno said in her speech at the Near-Death Experience Conference, when she went to the other side, she heard, you are worthy of all the love in the universe. And that's what I would say is, you are worthy of all the love in the universe. Don't let anybody tell you who you are. Don't let anybody tear you down. Don't let anybody's projections of their own fear make you feel bad about yourself, make you question yourself. So that's easier said than done. Remember who you are and put a bubble of light around yourself and literally disengage. If someone's being hurtful, you don't even have to say a mean thing back. Just, I'm not willing to participate in this. I'm glad you said, you know, that you just disengage and not say anything because you can get caught up into don't let anybody do that to you. And so yeah. people then think, oh, well, I can't let them do that. So I have to push, push back. back. And it's, it's not that. And when you do find that inner peace, when you do the inner work, because everything really is also a reflection of us. Yeah. So what is it that's showing up for me in my external world that I need to work on? Yes. So that I can heal that so that I can then amplify my light, which I loved also because I wanted to ask you about this, about coming full circle about spirituality. And what do you believe that light is, or do you have a relationship with God, creator, yeah. source, the divine light? Mm -hmm. And do you pray? Oh, yes. I, I, but my prayer doesn't look like getting down on my knees in prayer. Uh, I talk to spirit all day long and I talk to all of, I do believe in Jesus Christ. I do believe in God. I do believe in ascended masters and entities and angels. I don't think that God is above us. I don't think that Jesus Christ is above us. They are God to me is source. It's an all-knowing energy. It is not a person. It is not. It is neither male nor female, though. I believe that when people encounter God, it has a more masculine sort of voice from what I've heard, but fatherly, fatherly and warm and loving. It's, so we call him father, and I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem with that. I believe that God loves every single one of us, no matter what, and that we are all lovable and that we are all part of God. God is the fruit, we are the wedges of the fruit. And so we are just extensions of God. So he is not, he, it, whatever is not above us. It is what we are made of. So I am God, you are God. And I know some religions don't like that because, it, but Jesus Christ, I believe is a sort of ascended master, a being, a, a, a light being put into a human form. And, but I don't worship Jesus Christ, I don't read the Bible. And if you do, that's great. That's fine. Um, but for me, it doesn't resonate. For me, what resonates is I talk to him directly. I just say, my thing is I say, God, Jesus, angels, spirit guides, ascended masters, loved ones in spirit. I do gratitude sometimes. Thank you so much for this. I see that you did this for me. I see recognizing them and saying, I can see that I asked for this and you brought it in. And then I say, Hey, I really would could use a little help. Spirit guides will not intervene unless you ask them. We have free will for a reason. That is so we can learn things on our own. But if you ask spirit guides, they will step in. It may just not be the way you thought it was going to. So trust them. And I look up. I don't know. They're not up. They're all around us. But it just feels good to me sometimes. And I say, spirit guides, I need a change here. Show me the path. I'll do the work. But you lead me to the job, the program, the community, the project, whatever it is. I've said, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent and it's due tomorrow. I have no money. I, I just ask that you take this from me and show up with the money. And somehow it always does. And I, I don't want to promise that it'll work out the way you think. It doesn't mean you're just automatically going to get $10,000 in your bank account the next day, but just wait and see what happens. And sometimes I also say fake it till you make it because you may be like, is that really going to work? But so what? Try it. Just try it. It can't hurt. Oh, so good. I'd like to dig in a, just a little bit deeper here because I think so many people um, are in need. Yeah. And I've been there almost my whole life, right? High highs and low lows. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
And I think the key piece is, is faith Mm -hmm. is believing that and surrendering. Oh yeah. I hand this over to you, creator, God, source, the divine universe, spirit, whatever name you want to give. I hand this over to you. I don't want to do this without you. I need some help. I need some intervention. Um, And I know that if it is to my highest and best, it will come. Yep. I say in my highest and best good and with harm to none, because I could ask for a hundred thousand dollars and then someone dies and then I get their money. I don't want that. I would really, I would really rather not be paid because somebody lost their life. So I always say in everyone's highest and best good and with harm to none, I ask that this debt is taken care of somehow, some way I leave it to you. I'm willing to show up. So where do I need to go? Show me where I need to show up and I will show up. I will do the work, but you got to show me what is the work? I don't know. I don't even right. know where to go. And right. every time it's worked, it's come together. Even just me moving to Prescott, Arizona. I was in Virginia. I had run out of money. Things weren't working the way I thought they were going to. I'd moved there from LA and I just, my lease was up and I'm like, I can't afford the raise in, and I don't, but I don't know where to go. I, I can't go back to LA. I don't have any money. Where am I going? And I said, please just show me the way. I don't have any money and I don't know what to do. The next day, my friend called me from Prescott and said, hey, there's this job that's hiring here that I'm recommending you for. And I think you should come here. And moving here was the best thing I ever did. I'm part of this amazing community. We're doing great things together. Uh, I work for her production company now, and we're doing this awesome music festival. And my life has only improved tenfold since I came here and found my, I'm like, this was where I was supposed to be. There's also a feeling of, okay, there's something about a pregnancy that I'm trying to work out here. Um, okay. It's interesting. Did this feels like, and I don't know if she would have told you this, but I feel like you have another sibling on the other side that would have been like a miscarriage or something like that. Do you know if she lost another child? And there's there anyone that did that might have been I like, a, okay, it might be your, cause I'm feeling there's a baby there that didn't make it to this earth that Mm -hmm. she's with on the other side that just wanted to let you know that she has your baby on the other side as well um and your your mom no matter what even if she never i don't i wanted to say she i don't know if you would have had a uh, it it was a girl Mm -hmm. okay so you knew that um i i do feel like there's this she's holding this girl um this little girl in her of course she's on the other side grown grown a bit, but she said, she's still my mom. It does just because we didn't get to spend earthly time together. It really feels like uh, she's with you a lot and that you actually haven't forgotten her in that way that you actually like talk to her or do you have that relationship with her? Do you actually connect with her in that way? Um, I don't actively, but whenever I hear the name okay. of, of what she was going to be named, oh, yeah. um, I, it, it, you know, reconnects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just a knowledge that she's, th- she's always there. Yes, yeah. um, when, when you really start opening your eyes to see how magical life can be, will not disappoint you. That's Thank it. Thank you so much for your time today, Shannon. I, I want to hang this. out. Look, I'm going to come visit you and I mean, with my hat. Anytime with your, and you better wear your hat. Thank you for having me, Lee. I, I love this show and I, but I just I, believe that this is a great, a great and worthy show that will grow and grow and grow so that more people can get the message that you're so beautifully sharing. So thanks for having me. Thank you, darling. Take care. Bye. You everybody. Too. Bye.